I think to myself, if I were up here in front of you right now, and this is going to become very important as you move, I move into the other slides. Um, if I stomped a puppy to death out here, up here, just a little puppy, and stomped it right here to death in front of you, most of you would need therapy. And I would be arrested probably faster than killing a black man for killing a puppy. Now, I want you to look at this photo very closely, and I want you to see who's in it. More important than the man hanging, because you've got to understand the lynchings that occurred in America happened after slavery. Not during. Thousands of lynchings happened after slavery because this is a reaction to white fear of what we would do once freed. But we didn't create a vigilante group to take out white people, but they did create a vigilante group to take us out now that we're free. See, that happened after slavery. They were called the what? The Ku Klux Klan. They don't wear hoods anymore. They wear suits. But they're alive and well all over the world, even here. So look at who's in the picture. I want you to look at this little girl in particular. You can't see her closely, but she's actually grimacing, like smirking. Now, remember, let's go back to the puppy concept here. She would be loathed and torn up probably if this was a puppy, which means he's less than that because she's not disturbed. This little girl is not, is not disturbed by this, but she should be, shouldn't she? People always ask me, they go, Joy, what was the impact on white people? There it is. Right there. Can't feel any empathy for him. None, zero zip. There's a little one back here, even smaller. Because whatever she's been taught or told, socialized to believe, makes him no longer human. That's the greatest danger to white people, is that they can't feel it. And there's a reason why white people can't feel what we're talking about. My God, what would you then feel? It's tough. So I've got to believe, oh, it's all over now, it's not my fault, I don't benefit, it's not a big deal, let's move on, it's not all of those things. But we don't say that to Jewish people. I dare you. But you have to understand, when you unearth this one, that's what we did to our children. Let's move forward. This is a similar photo to the one that uh, is used in um, Denzel's movie. Now, and again, most important, this is a man that's being burned. Also, I won't read the depiction, but there are newspaper accounts of this. It's written in a book called 100 Years of Lynching by Ginsburg. No pictures, just newspapers that say not only did they burn him, they decapitated him, cut him into pieces, and used parts of his body as things to put on mantles. So people would say, get me a tongue, would you, or a liver, a little crisp? So I could put it on the mantle. Now, again, I want you to look at the folks. I want you to look at who's here. We're not talking about the toothless, big gut, hooded wonder, are we? We're looking at plain old, common, dressed up folks. They're squeezing, please, I want my picture taken. Are you following me? This is somebody's cousin, uncle, somebody. And the ability to do that dehumanize this man and rob them of their humanity all at the same time. All at the same time. That is the most dangerous, treacherous thing that could happen. What did Hitler do? He dehumanized human beings, put babies in ovens. Anything that robs us of our humanity is a danger to everyone. And that is what's going on with people of African descent all over the world because not only did it get done here, but who do we tell the entire world we told these people don't deserve any value? Everyone wants to be American, not y'all. But when we go, I mean, I literally go to countries all over the world. America sets the standard and thank God for what happened later. Let's move forward. So a lot of people start saying, well, y'all got free, right? Y'all are free, everything's fine. Because <laughs> that's see, whenever you talk about post-traumatic slave syndrome, people get locked there. So there's a myth that after slavery ended, the playing field was leveled. Was it? 
Remember, all the lynchings occurred after slavery. That wasn't during, after slavery. So you had black sharecropping. Now, we didn't get a lot of black history in our schooling. I have four degrees and three of them advanced degrees. Never did I get black history. I got about two pages of black history, and one of them, what page was a picture? And there was a picture of the little folks with the cabin. You probably saw the same picture. It's a little cabin, the little guy on the porch with the banjo, little children running, frolicking about, eating watermelon, right? Everybody happy? And we certainly need little Mary and little, little Johnny to believe that they were, they were happy. <laughs> the slaves were happy people. And they had a nice place to live. Because we couldn't have them feeling cognitive what? Not little Mary. She can't start questioning what grandpa did. So I want you to see this because those are leftover slave quarters. He's a sharecropper. So now let's go back and take a look at sharecropping. Now these are folks that were slaves, no longer slaves, decided I'm going back to be a sharecropper on the same plantation that I was enslaved. Why would you do that? You all heard about Katrina, yes? Yeah. See, I was there. <laughs> My family's from Louisiana. I went to the Ninth Ward. Sometimes you can't pay attention to what the news says. It's important to actually go eyeball what's going on, which was very interesting because it was one of the most horrific events I'd ever seen and probably will ever see in my life. Well, black folks were just simply treated differently. Did you notice that? Here's the good news about Katrina. Everybody noticed it. So all the rest of the world where we learn, send us your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, your democracy, your equality. They said, what happened with that Katrina thing? All that stuff y'all talked about. Well, let me read this. This is from Associated Press taken straight from the newspaper. In the front, actually, the top part here is actually a woman, but they think it's a man. Anyway, it says, a young man walks through chest-deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on Tuesday, August 30th, 2005. Same body of water down here, excuse me. Two residents wade through chest-deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. Now, same event. Same water, white people, black people. We've told you what you see now. That removes your what? Dissonance, because these people can't be perceived as looting. They're white people. White people don't loot. Now, the truth of the matter is, I don't care what any of them are doing. It doesn't matter, but I'm going to still the social conscience by letting you know, don't forget, this is a looter. Matter of fact, what you last heard was that they were looters and rapists. Did you not? So don't they deserve it? That wasn't back in, oh, I don't know, slavery, though, was it? Now we're going to kind of move into operationalizing that to look at what is it, how, does it, how do we begin to uh, connect that, that behavior, those, that history, to what we're dealing with and what you're dealing with right now and what we're seeing. And very often people say, well, is everything post-traumatic slave syndrome? Obviously, that, that would, you know, trivialize all the work. You know, we cannot lay squarely on the shoulders of post-traumatic all the problems that we see, we see nor can we uh, place all the problems squarely on the shoulders of white people or any of the above. So hopefully we won't um, digress into anything that is that foolish in terms of a discussion. Because, you know, it, that's another thing that happens in terms of trying to, to deal with the pushback around this. Uh, then we move into extremes, and it tends to dilute the realities that are going on. So um, uh, hopefully we're way beyond all that. Well, now she's saying everything is post-traumatic. No, I'm not. Um, and most of my work, uh, my background is really in the field, doing, um, you know, doing work in the community and grassroots. That's where my, my training was in terms of my clinical work. And just, you know, the fact that I've always been, uh, this work started on the ground. It didn't start here. Matter of fact, the attention, I got the attention of places like Oxford and Harvard and, you know, the um, Ivy League and major institutions, even, even the, uh, the FBI, you know, but... Those were things that happened after um, I did started doing the work on the grassroots level. Um, and so it's, for me, my, my commitment is to healing. 
So this is not an, an exercise uh, in some kind of broad intellectual esoteric. It's really about how do we then take this information and help a person extricate themselves from uh, behavior that they've learned and or been socialized to believe black and white and everyone in, in the middle that has been affected by this. Um, what do we do? So this is kind of looking at the contemporary uh, kind of reflection of the trauma, uh, which is right, right supremacy and terrorism. That continues. We, we see that on a daily basis in the United States as well as, as here. Uh, this book is called um, Breaking Rank by Norm Stamper. Norm Stamper is a 34-year police veteran. He was a chief of police for the cities of San Diego and Seattle. This is a white man wrote this book called Breaking Rank, and he really did. <laughs> so all I can tell you is he broke rank. I've been trying to meet Norm. Norm travels quite a bit, and he gets a considerable uh, amount of uh, death threats because of what he's done. But he talked about, and this is contemporary. And remember, that's what we're looking at. How does it reflect itself today? I've heard some police officers refer to prostitute slayings or to the slayings of blacks as misdemeanor murders, employing an unofficial code for them NHI, which means no human involved. Now these are on telephone calls. These are on calls that you hear on police officers speaking. Hey, what do you have? Well, we have a NHI. We have no human involved. It's a black person killed. Do you see what I'm saying? Again, the dehumanization reflecting itself in just their casual involvement with one another. San Diego cops confessed to a myriad other acts of discrimination, including additionally dehumanizing the references to blacks on a radio call, just an 1113 nigger. 1113 is a code for an injured animal. 